Amazing. Hey, grab your Bibles. Go ahead and open up to James chapter 5. Uh, tonight we're going to finish up our teaching series on the book of James. So if you've not been with us or just joined us for the first time or the first time in like a couple months, um, what we've been doing is walking through the New Testament book of James written by Jesus' brother uh, to see what Jesus' brother has to say about what it means for us to be followers of Jesus um, in the 21st century. And so um, go ahead and open up your Bible to James chapter 5. That's where we're going to be. Uh, this will conclude our series. Uh, and then as we mentioned up top, we're going to have two weeks off here because uh, of some mission trips and Easter Sunday, and then we will come back um, the, the 28th and, and, and kick some new stuff off. So that's the first thing. Hey, uh, before we get started, I want to let you know, you, you'll see me holding a cup of water. Um, you ever just wake up feeling like you're pretty sure you never want to wake up again? Um, that's how this morning was for me. Uh, so I'm very sick. If you didn't see me before the service, it's because I... Shh, it's because I was hiding. Uh, I don't want to get you sick. Um, really, um, I didn't want to pass along the germs that my daughter passed along to me. Um, she was feeling terrible, so now I'm feeling terrible, and I don't want you to feel terrible. Um, so you didn't really see me before the service. You probably won't see me after the service much. Um, and uh, so if tonight you're like, why does Brian seem a little out of it? It's because um, death is at my door. Uh, don't, you laughed. Um, <laughs> All right, well, let's open the word. That, that'll help us at least. All right, James chapter 5, verse 13. Here's how it begins tonight. Again, final uh, words of the brother of Jesus. He begins this way. He says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. You know, you know it's interesting. Um, one of the things that I'm aware of when we read the Bible is that there are passages in the Bible that are really confusing and difficult and hard to understand. And so maybe you've run across those passages. Maybe that was in your private time reading the Bible, or maybe uh, we were actually unpacking it as a church here and you were listening to a sermon and you saw the text and it was confusing for you. In fact, let, let me just put it this way, just so you are aware that you, you're not alone in this. Um, would you slip your hand in the air if you have ever been confused by a passage or a text in the Bible? Okay. All right, good. And, and those of you who aren't raising your hand have never read the Bible. Okay, that's, that's what's going on here. So, so listen here. Um, I just don't want you to think for a moment that you're alone if you don't understand a text in the Bible. There are texts in the Bible that are confusing, even for me. And when I say even for me, I mean as a man who is much older than all of you, has gone to school, got an undergrad degree in this, and then got a master's degree in this. There are still times I open and read the Bible and go, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't know. There's still times that happens for me. And so I think it's important for us to recognize that sometimes when we read the Bible, we're going to come across texts, we're going to come across passages, we're going to come across ideas that are really difficult for us to understand. But then here's the danger. The danger is that because there are texts that are difficult to understand, that when we run across texts that are easy to understand, we would confuse the two. So in other words, it's okay to read your Bible and occasionally run across a passage and just go, I have no idea, and then do this spiritual discipline of just turning to the next page and keep going, right? Like, that's okay. But then sometimes we run across texts like this, and we try to put it in the complicated bucket, and it's not, right? Like, this is not complicated. This says, is anyone among you in trouble? And high school is just trouble, always, all the time. It is just constant you being in trouble, okay? Like this is you. Is anyone in trouble? Is anyone stressed out? Is anyone overwhelmed? Did anyone have a hard afternoon with their mother? You're like, that's too close. It's true. <laughs> Did anyone have a tough week with their friends? Is anyone else wondering if they're going to graduate high school? Is anyone here wondering if you're actually going to make it to college or be able to afford college? Is any one of you in trouble? And here's what James says. Let them pray. And here's what, if you're an experienced Christian, like even if you've been a Christian for like five minutes or longer, here's what you're so tempted to do. You're like, is anyone in trouble? Is, is that like referring to a specific type of trouble? Walk me through this. Maybe there's like an interesting thought there. And then you get on to let them pray and you're like, can we talk about like what Greek word is the word pray there? And like, help me understand. Does that mean some kind of like different prayer? No, it just means pray. Okay, like that is what James is trying to do here. Again, there are complicated hard to understand verses in the Bible. And then there's this one. Like if you're in trouble, if you're overwhelmed, if you're anxious, if this has been a hard spring, if you're not sure what college is gonna look like, if your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're having trouble with them, like whatever is going on, if you're in trouble, the Bible gives you a very simple command, let them pray. And, and then here's what I'm just gonna observe. My tendency when I ask people how their prayer life is, is I, more times than not, I tend to hear that it's not going that well. 
And maybe if I asked you today how your prayer life is going, you would say something like this. I don't pray as much as I need to. I'm not very good at prayer. My prayer life is kind of weak. Like if I asked you to write down a number between one and 10 on how your prayer life was going right now, one being the worst it's ever been, 10 being it's the best you could imagine, and you had to pick a number, but you couldn't choose seven, where would your prayer life be? Yeah, because you like seven. Seven's nice. Seven's like, ah, oh, it's not great, but it's okay. But if you have to choose a six, that's like a D. And if you have to choose an eight, that's like you're feeling pretty good about it. And here's my guess. I, I'm just going to suggest that I think there are a lot of you in this room who would say it's below a seven. Like, it's not that great. Like, your prayer life isn't actually booming right now. You don't actually feel like you're that good at praying. You sit down to pray and you fall asleep. Your phone buzzes. You get confused. You, you just you don't pray that well, and yet here's what James is going to tell us. If you're in trouble, he's going to give you a very simple command. It's not complicated. It's not hard to understand. He's going to say pray. And if your answer to me is I'm not good at praying, here's what I'd suggest to you. First thought for tonight is the only way to get better at prayer, or at prayer is to pray. That's the only way. The only way you get better at prayer, at praying, is praying. Um, there's no other way. There's no like book you read. There's no secret sauce or secret formula to this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sick today. Okay. Give me a break. But here's what, there's no secret formula. Like, don't, don't miss me on this. Like if you want to get better at baseball, go play baseball. If you want to get better at math, do play, play math. I, I don't know. <laughs> if you want to get better at lifting weights, lift weights. If you want to get faster, run. Like, like hear me. There's no secret formula. But, but here's what a lot of you want. You want some secret to how to do this well, and there is no secret. You just choose to pray. The only way to get better at prayer is to pray. And so um, James's command is if you're in trouble, which we've established, you're in high school, and therefore you're just always in trouble, okay? Um, and, and here is the command for you, that you would be a person who pray, prays. So I, I want to give you five thoughts on prayer right now. Um, and these are not like the only five thoughts on prayer. These are just five things I think you guys need to hear right now. Uh, I'm your pastor. I love you. I care about you. I talk with you. I understand where you're at. Um, and I just want to give you these five thoughts. Number one, decide when and where you will have times of prayer. That's the first one. I need you, if you want to get better at prayer, if you want to be the type of person who says, my prayer life's at an eight or a nine right now, I want you to decide when and where you're going to pray. Here's my observation. If I ask some of you, when and where are you going to have volleyball practice this week, you could probably tell me, right? It's on Tuesday. It's at four o'clock. If I asked you what time or what day is your math class, you, you could point on your calendar and tell me where it is. Now, now hear me. Some of you are like the type A person who actually has everything in your calendar on your phone or in your little notebook thing that's all cutesy that you journal in, like that thing. And then some of you have never even seen a calendar. Um, and, and, and so, like, hear me. I, I'm not saying you have it on the calendar. I'm just saying you know. You know what time things are going on in your life. You know what time you're heading over to see that person. You know what time you're going to be getting up. Or if you have a job, you know what time work is. And here's the stunning thing for most Christians. You know everything that's going to happen during your week. You've planned it. You've calendared it. And yet you've not scheduled any time to pray. And listen, I don't mean just like the random prayer you throw up to the Lord when you're kind of stressed or overwhelmed or walking somewhere. That's a good thing and you should be doing that. I don't just mean the prayer we do when we say, okay, we're done with this song and so we're going to pray together. That's a good thing that we do. I mean you carving out 5, 10, or 15 minutes to go pray by yourself. I don't, I'm not asking you for an hour. I'm not asking you for three hours. I'm not asking you to like pray all day. I'm just asking you to find five, 10 or 15 minutes. If you're going to come claim um, that you don't have five minutes in your schedule this week to carve out for prayer, I will look you in the eye and call you a liar because you are, you have that time and you have built in everything else into your schedule. And so my question is, when are you going to build that in? And, and hear me, don't start with, I'm going to pray five minutes every day. Just pick a day this week. So for me, I'll just let you know the, the discipline in my life in the last year has been this. Um, every morning, uh, I go on a walk with my daughter. I wake her up at 7 a.m. and we get up and we get, she gets in the stroller and I push her around the block and we walk about two miles every single morning, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. It's a great time. Um, and, and usually I listen to podcasts or listen to music, um, but on Monday mornings, that's my prayer walk. Uh, and so on Monday mornings, I've just decided, Lord, I'm not going to do anything else. As I push grace on this walk, I'm just going to pray. That has become a discipline for me. Thursday mornings, I have a prayer group that meets here at Calvary. Uh, it's a number of pastors and directors on staff. We get together and we pray. Um, I have learned that prayer times don't just happen randomly in my own life. They only happen when I schedule them to happen. Other prayers happen. I pray with my wife before bed. I pray before meals. Those things happen. But seriously, just sitting down and praying about something only happens when I schedule it. I want to encourage some of you to schedule it. 
Maybe even before you leave here, you would just choose a day this week and actually put it in your phone's calendar to say, I am going to pray at this time in this space. And not just when you're going to pray, but where are you going to pray? Is it in your bedroom? Is it in your backyard? Is it as you walk home from school? Where is it going to be and what's it going to be? So that's number one. Um, Number two, I would encourage you to pray with other people, um, to pray with other people. So so one of the... um, one of the things we do as Christians, it's, it's really um, classic Christian stuff, is someone shares with you that they're struggling. And so maybe even before you walked into church tonight, um, they talked about how it was hard with their mom or how things are difficult at school right now. They're stressed out. They're overwhelmed. They're not sure uh, what they're going to do with all of this. And you say to them, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And then you say this great thing. You said, I'll be praying for you, Right. So we say this, I'll be praying for you, which is like our way of condo- like our condolences to you. I'll be praying for you, which is a lovely thing. But if you're anything like me, you probably say, I'll be praying for you more than you actually end up praying for that person, right? Like, don't act like I'm the only one here. Like you've said this where you say, I'll be praying for you, but you don't actually end up praying for them. And so here's um, the discipline I'm trying to build into my life. And I would love for some of you to build into yours, that you would just pray for them on the spot, that you would just say, hey, I'm so sorry to hear that. Can we pray right now? Can we pray for what you're going through right now? And listen, you're not going to be perfect that this is not going to happen every time. But here's what I think is wild. I think some of you have never prayed for another individual in this room. Like you've never actually stopped in this room at our church and prayed for someone before they leave. Maybe tonight before you leave, you just need to find the person who shared something with you beforehand and say, hey, you shared that. Can I pray for you before we leave the room tonight? Some of you have never prayed for a friend on your high school campus. Like it's just never happened. Maybe it's never even occurred to you to do that. You're always like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And you offer to pray for them. Some of you have never prayed for someone who's not a Christian. Maybe that becomes a rhythm in your life. They say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And you say, hey, can I pray? I'm just telling you, I've talked to Christians, non-Christians, everyone throughout my life. It is so rare that someone says to me when I say, can I pray for you? They're like, no, I'm cool. Like that's not usually their response. Usually they're like, yeah, I'll I'll take some prayer. Uh, And then you pray right there on the spot. Maybe that's a rhythm you need to build into your life. Number three. Uh, is to create a prayer list. Again, some of you have a journal or a notebook that, that you're kind of big with. And usually if you have a journal or a notebook, you probably have some prayers written down in there and you have a prayer list. Uh, but for those of us who you know, don't have a journal or don't have a notebook, um, I, I want to talk to you. Um, best place to put your prayer list is right on your phone. You have a note section on your phone. If you have an iPhone, this is a little Apple note section. Um, you go right in there and make a prayer list. And, and here's the crazy thing. Like many of you don't have a prayer list. But what's wild is many of you have a list of the names of your future potential children, right? (laughs) I know. I know you do. You have that. Or you have some wild other list of some other crazy thing. Yeah. Some of you are like, that got too close. Yeah, it did. Hey, but listen, eyes right here. Eyes right here. If you have that list but don't have a prayer list, I think you're missing out on an opportunity. And so so here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. Seriously. If you have your phone with you right now and you're like, wow, I should really have a prayer list. Um, I don't see a reason why you shouldn't take your phone out before this sermon is over and create a note titled prayer list. And and maybe someone's told you something in the last week. You just need to add it to your prayer list. Like truly, it's pretty hard to pray if you don't know what you're praying for. And, And so maybe you need to create that prayer list on your phone. I want to encourage you to not, your phone can be a distraction in prayer, but your phone can actually be a real gift if you have a list and you're working through that. That way you're not dependent on having a piece of paper. It goes with you wherever you go. And whenever you have time, you can stop and and read through that prayer list. And so I want to encourage some of you tonight to start a prayer list. Again, if I see you pulling out your phone right now, I'm just going to assume the best in you and assume uh, you're creating a prayer list on your phone as we speak here. So that is number three. Number four, um, pray through the Bible. I won't spend long on this one other than to say sometimes um, it's difficult to find the language in prayer um, to really spend time praying. And so I want to encourage you to pray through the Bible, maybe specifically the book of Psalms, that you would open up the book of Psalms and that you would read through a Psalm. So Psalm 22 or Psalm 48 or Psalm 67, whatever it is, it almost doesn't matter which Psalm as much as you open up to the Psalms, you read through it and allow the prayer, the song they were singing in the Psalms to be your prayer, to start making your prayers sound like the Bible to start making your prayers use the same language and grammar that the people in the Bible are using. This will give you the ability to understand this is what the people of God have always prayed like, and this is how I can pray. And then here's um, the final thing is to structure your prayer time. It's to structure your prayer time. And here's what I mean by this. 
I think it's really difficult if you decide, hey, Tuesday at 5 p.m., I'm going to pray for 15 minutes. I think it's really difficult to go in Tuesday at 5 p.m. and just try to figure out what to pray. Sometimes we think prayer has to be super spontaneous in order for it to be real or in order for God to love it, but I don't actually believe that's true. I believe spirit prayer can be spontaneous. I believe prayer can be something that you just kind of go into and kind of encounter God in. But, but I think when you're just starting, like if you've never really sat down to pray before, it can be really difficult. And so structuring your prayer time is important. Here's a few different ways you could do it. If you have a prayer list and you have 10, 15, 20 items on it, because every time you hear about something that breaks your heart, you just put it on the list. You can just pray through that. There's other people who talk about praying in such a way that you thank God for who he is first, you praise God, and then you get to things you're asking God for. That's another way of doing it. I, I just want to show you the way I pray, um, the way I pray when I have prayer times and, 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 and hear me like, the Bible's over here, I'm over here. Like, this isn't like some like, this is how the Bible says to pray. This is just how Brian Howard prays and maybe it'll be a useful image for some of you. Can we put this image up on the screen? Uh, we're gonna put this picture up here. And so this should be pretty obvious to you. This is a, a stone you throw it in the water and it has these ripples coming out, like these concentric circles. And when I sit down to pray or when I'm on my walk with my daughter and I pray, um, this is how I pray. I wanna share this image with you that it might encourage maybe some of you in the room. And so here's how I tend to pray. Again, these concentric circles, the smallest one is in the middle. And when I start praying, I start with praying for the individual in this world who I know more flaws about than anyone else. And that's me. Um, I start by praying for me, the smallest circle in the middle, and I pray uh, for myself, and I pray for what I'm worried about or anxious about. I pray for the things that are stressing me out. I pray for the things that I know I have on my calendar that day or that week. I tend to pray for things um, that God would make me more holy, that God would make me strong, that God would give me wisdom, that he would give me courage. I pray for myself. Sometimes people ask, like, why do you pray for yourself first? Shouldn't you pray for others first? Here's what I've learned. Um, if I pray for myself first, what I'll really quickly do is realize that I'm actually not the center of the universe. What I'll really quickly realize is that there's so much more outside of me than here. And so I begin praying for myself. I just pray, God, that you would meet me, that you would empower me, that your spirit would be with me. And then I go out a circle from there. I pray for my family. And for me, my family is my wife and my daughter. So I pray for my wife, that she would be filled with courage and wisdom, that you would give her strength, Lord, that, that she would be filled with blessing and that your favor would be on her life, that she would know your peace, that you would keep her healthy. I pray for my daughter, that she would be wise, that she would be strong, that she would be a young lady filled with courage. And most of all, that my daughter would know Jesus one day. I, I pray for my family and then I pray for my extended family. So for right now, for me, that looks like my parents, my brothers, um, my, my extended family, aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas. I pray for extended family. Then after my family, I start praying for my small group. I don't mean the small group I lead. I mean the small group I'm part of. I pray for the other adults in that group and just pray for their lives. After that, I pray for my staff, the people I work with every day, the people who I work for, um, the volunteers in high school ministry. Then after that, I pray for Calvary Community Church as a whole, just pray for the entire church. And then after that, I pray for our community, like the Caneo Valley. Then I pray for our state and then our nation and then our world. You see how it works? It starts with the middle and then it goes out and out and out. And I wonder if for some of you, that would just be an image that would help you. Because here's what you do. You just start praying for yourself. And then when you're out of things to pray for yourself, you just move to the next layer. And then when you're out of things to pray for your family, you just move to the next layer and you just keep going and going and going as the circles go out. Maybe that's useful for you. Maybe it's not. I'm not saying this is the only way or even the best way to pray. I'm just saying it's the way I've structured my prayer times and I found it so fruitful. And maybe that would be something fruitful for you. Because again, James is going to say, if you're in trouble, if you're stressed out, if you're worried, if you're anxious, if things are difficult in your life, right now. He doesn't give you some complex thing to do. He says, pray. Uh, and that's what we're going to encourage you to do. He goes on the bottom half of 13 and says this. He says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. So he begins with, is anyone stressed or troubled? Is anyone kind of having a tough time? Let them pray. And then he says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Uh, and so he's going to start with prayer and then he's going to move us to singing. He's going to move us to songs of praise. And so I, I want to give you five thoughts right now on singing, just like I did for prayer. And, and here's the first thought, um, that worship is more than singing, but not less than singing. And so this is an important phrase in the way I've always wanted to frame it for worship, that worship is more than singing. And so if you ever hear anyone say worship is more than singing, they're right. 
Worship is our response to who God is. It's our response to what God has done in our lives. Worship is far more than us standing around singing. Worship is our entire lives being oriented to God. It's us treasuring and loving God above every other thing so that when you obey the Bible, that's worship. When you give generously, that's worship. When you love other people, that's an act of worship. Romans 12 is going to tell us um, that we're called to offer our bodies, to offer them up as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, and that that is our spiritual act of worship. So that worship is far more than singing, but, but then here's the other side of it. It's not less than singing, Mean, meaning worship is going to be more activities than just singing, but if singing has no place in your life, you're not really living into the worship that God's called you toward. Like worship is more than singing, but it's not less than singing. Singing is a central thing for the people of God. If you flip through the entire Bible, what you'll see is the people of God love singing. They're commanded to sing. They constantly sing. All throughout human history, the people of God have cried out to God in prayer and in song. Um, everywhere we go all over the world, there are Christians singing. Like on Friday, there's going to be a group that gets on a plane and flies to Ukraine. Anyone? Okay. Right. Um, you're going to find people in Ukraine singing to Jesus. And then on Saturday, there'll be a group that gets on a plane and flies to Uganda, right? And we're going to find people in Kampala, Uganda, who sing to Jesus. Like singing's not an us thing. It's not like, a, oh, we love our worship band and we got great people here. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with our worship band. It has everything to do with the people of God love singing. So, so here's why I share this with you. This is not just like, oh, duh, obvious. Um, Someday if you go off to college or go off to some other church and they try to minimize singing as if singing's not that big of a deal to God, I think you need to find a new church. Like I think singing's that important. I think singing isn't just some random side dish to the Christian faith, but God has placed it right at the center. God doesn't just command his people to love him. God commands his people to sing songs of praise to him, as we see right here in this text. If you're happy, if you're overjoyed, if things are going well, sing songs of praise to the Lord. Singing is central to the Christian faith. Next thought. Singing gives us language to understand God. Here's what I mean by that. I don't just mean the words in the song are true things about God. I mean that singing is a different kind of language than us speaking. Now, I don't mean that literally, like we're singing in English. I get that. But what I'm saying is that when I sing to God, I commune with him, I understand him, I interact with him in a different way than when I talk about him. So here's what you need to understand. The Christian faith is not just about you understanding things about God. I need to get that into your head. It's not just about you getting more information about God. You, you don't grow in Jesus by just getting more information. You grow in Jesus by experiencing Jesus, not just intellectually, but emotionally. Through his presence, you actually encounter Jesus. This is so important to me that when we sing, it's not just that we're saying true things about God and that's a good thing. It is that we are encountering God in a way that for whatever reason, we do not encounter him in different ways. So, so here's what I mean. There's just something special that happens when we sing. And I don't want to take that away from you. Like, I think some of you have this thing where you're like, I just love worship. I just love worship so much. I don't know what it is. I just love worship. And I don't think that's a bad thing. In fact, I think that's a true, good biblical thing. I think worship is something you're called to love. And I think sometimes what you get laid on is like this guilt of like, if you love worship, then somehow you don't love Jesus. Like, no, you love the experience of God that happens during worship. There's a language of singing that allows us to encounter God. I believe that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I want to encourage you toward that. That growing in faith isn't just your intellect. It's about that emotional experience that does help you. Now, if it's all emotional experience and no truth, yeah, that's a problem too. Uh, but I just want to encourage you to be a people who continue to sing. And then the next thing is this, um, singing and prints God's truth on our hearts and minds. So um, this, this should be painfully obvious to you, but I think it's really important. Um, there's a truth taught in the Bible, um, taught in Romans 8, taught in 1 John chapter 1, um, all over the Bible, and it's that you're a child of God. You've been adopted by him, and that's like a very true thing, and you should be memorizing scripture and knowing these truths. Uh, but one of the ways that we as a ministry, so this is talking from like us as a staff, the decisions we make, we try to teach truths not just through what we teach in the Bible, we try to teach it through our songs. And so in other words, I could give you a sermon about how you're a child of God, or we could sing a song 400,000 times that says, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am 
a child of God, right? Like this imprints it on our hearts and music gives us the ability to remember things that are true about us. So in that moment where you sin and you feel like God doesn't want anything to do with me anymore, God's sick of me, God's over me, God can't possibly forgive me anymore, he's probably done with me, you go, no, 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 I am a child of God, I've sung this a hundred times and I need to remember it. So in other words, music gives us the ability to remember these things, it ingrains us in our soul, that worship helps us remember these beautiful truths of God. And then um, next one, uh, singing gives us strength when we're weak. Um, Singing uh, just should be giving you strength when you're weak, uh, when you're overwhelmed, when you're stressed out, when you're exhausted, uh, when you're like me right now and you're just sick and you're tired. Um, Singing just gives us the ability um, to say, you know what? No, no, no. I believe God is with me. He's in me with it. I'm going to be okay. Singing gives us strength when we're weak. And then uh, for whatever reason, this one didn't make the slide. So I'll just say it out loud. Um, This last one, singing is most powerful when it happens together. Singing is most powerful when it happens together. Um, So in other words, like there's a value in you singing alone. There's a value in you having like your worship jam playlist on Spotify that you love. Like that's a value. Okay. Like you singing alone in the shower or just like crying out to God in your car, like embarrassingly loud where you stop singing so loud at the stoplight. You know what I mean? Like that type of thing. Um, Like there's a value in that. I don't want to take that away from you. Some beautiful times I've had in worship are are when I am alone with the Lord. But then I just want to tell you for some reason, God seems to value us singing together. And it's not like a mechanical thing where I can explain to you the logical reasons. I just want to tell you God's spirit shows up in a different way when we're singing together than he does alone. I'm not trying to diminish your time alone. I'm just trying to say when you gather together, something special happens. Like there's a reason summer camp is so powerful when we're there worshiping together. There's a reason it's powerful in this room. There's a reason it's powerful at Hume Lake. There's a reason uh, on our mission trips next week, we'll gather and, and worship together. There's a reason that's powerful. And it's not just because the songs are there or something like that. There's something powerful that happens when we're together. And that's just a Holy Spirit thing. It's just that God decides he's gonna show up in a different kind of way when we're together. And so if you've got it in your mind that you can just follow Jesus alone and without other people, I think you've missed something powerful here. And so again, uh, James is gonna tell us if you're happy, sing songs of praise. Verse 14 uh, is gonna go on this way. It says, is anyone among you sick? Yes. Um, It says, "Let, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. So here's what I love about this. Um, This tells me um, if I'm sick and I am sick, it says let the elders of the church, which is like the spiritual leaders, the spiritual people in the church who who are showing leadership and guiding and pastoring the church, let them pray over you, which is great news. Like I'm called to let people pray over me when I'm sick. And so um, this morning, uh, a pastor friend of mine here at this church, uh, who's also named Pastor Brian, a different Pastor Brian, it's very confusing, um, came up to me, knew I was sick and just prayed over me before I came up and preached at the 11 a.m. service, which was a beautiful, beautiful thing. But then I want to point out that it doesn't just say let people pray over them, but it says anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now in the Bible, anointing someone or covering someone with oil has a lot of different layers and meanings. And sometimes it's a spiritual act and sometimes it's an act of crowning someone king. But other times oil is just this reminder of of, that that oil was the way um, they did hygiene and, and at times the way they did medicine in the ancient world. So again, there's a lot of different meanings to oil, but but oil was ultimately something they would use for hygiene and something they would use for medicine, which tells me this, like, yes, I'm sick right now and people have prayed over me today, but you have better believe that I've got some NyQuil back there in the booth, right? Okay, Like, like it's both, it's both. And that's the beauty for Christians. Like Christians are not just called to pray. And if you take any medicine, it shows you don't have faith. But Christians aren't also called to just be like, well, I'll just take medicine and God wants me to be sick. So I won't even bother praying. God God invites us to both. He invites us to both. Have people pray over you and seek medicine. If it's a more serious thing, have people pray over you and do your surgery. Have people pray over you and do your treatment. God calls us toward both to receive the gift and the blessing of prayer and to receive the common grace, the common goodness of medicine in our lives. He calls us toward both. Uh, And I'm just going to argue, I think it's probably true for more of you that you err on this side you get sick and you take medicine and then people say they'll pray for you and you just kind of go, ah, that's fine. But you don't really believe in the value of that. I just want to remind you, like this is calling us toward this thing where like, okay, like yes, there's medicine and yes, there's hygiene and yes, there's like hand sanitizer and all that kind of stuff. But really like we want to allow people to pray over our lives. Uh, And then here's how it goes on at 15. 
It says, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. So here's the the thing that he's going to start to point out. He's going to start to point out that um, if you have sin in your life, um, and it's going to tell, when it talks about sin, it's really going to talk here about sin uh, that's not yet confessed. Um, I I think he's going to try to point something out here. And and, and here's this, I'll put out the statement and I'll explain what I mean. Um, That secret sin will always lead to spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional damage. That your secret sin will always lead to physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional damage. Now here's what I don't mean. I don't mean if you're ever sick, it's because you have sin. I do not believe the Bible teaches that there is a one-to-one connection between your sin and your sickness. I don't believe people who have cancer or have cancer because they sinned. I don't believe people who have colds did so because they sinned. I don't believe that is necessarily the case, but here's what I do believe. I do believe that if you have secret sin in your life, a secret addiction, a secret past, something you did, something you didn't do, um, something you just keep looking at on the internet, something you keep doing on your own, something you keep doing in private, whatever that thing is, I do not believe you can keep that for very long without it impacting you mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Uh, Like there's great research to show that when you try to lead a double life, like on Sundays, I'm like the Jesus person, but on Saturday nights, I'm the weed person. On Sunday, I'm the Jesus person. And then Sunday night after church, I'm the pornography person. Like if you try to do that for very long, it will start to rip apart your mind and your soul and your body and you will be physically ill because of it. You will be anxious that someone is going to find you out. You will be discouraged, overwhelmed, and perhaps even depressed that you are that double-minded. You are that two-faced. Like it does set in. I'm not just like making things up here. I am telling you that if you try to hide secret sin for very long in your life, it will wreck you physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every every conceivable way. And so I'm just pleading with some of you to drag something into the light, to tell your friends, to tell your small group leader, to tell someone who matters to you. And then hear me on this. I'm going to say this because I believe it. I don't think many of you will take me up on it, but if you do, I promise you'll find more freedom than anything else. I think some of you need to tell your parents about what's going on. I think you need to tell your mom that you're addicted to something. I think you need to tell your dad that you're struggling with porn. I think you need to tell your parents that something's going on in your life and they don't know about it, but you need help. Because as long as it stays in the shadows, it gains strength. But when you drag it into the light, it's freed up. You're able to walk in freedom from it. And hear me, some of you think that's crazy. Here's what I think is crazy. I think it's crazy that you've been trying to beat this thing on your own for years and you've not made any progress. And yet you think this week's the week that you'll make progress. I'm just telling you, like secret sin will damage your life. And hear me, I'm not trying to get you out of your secret sin or get you to confess anything to me. I'm just trying to do this because I believe it's the road toward your freedom. The road toward your freedom is you confessing that sin. Here's how Justin Knowles, our speaker at camp two years ago, put it. I love this. It's always stuck with me. He said, confessing to God is a given. Confessing to others is a gift. Confessing to God is a given. But confessing to others, to other people, your parents, your friends, your pastor, your um, small group leader, people in your life. It's a gift. It's a gift to you. And, and here's why. Um, you, you may be under the impression that, that I'm standing here trying to talk to you about this because like, if you are addicted to something or if you have secret sin, it means you're not saved or God doesn't love you. And here's what I need you to hear. Like every eye in the room on me, like God still loves you in the midst of your addiction. You are still saved even if you're hooked on something. You are still God's child even if you have some shame hidden in your heart. Your secret sin does not cost you your salvation, but it will cost you your joy. Like I need you to internalize that. Your secret sin will not cost you your salvation. That is secure in Jesus Christ. You cannot lose your salvation. You can lose your joy. You can lose your peace. You can lose your your sense of God's presence. Like you can get to a place where your heart is so hardened that you are still saved, but you're not actually enjoying the joy of salvation. That's why David in Psalm chapter 51 says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. David who just sinned, he just slept with someone else's wife. He just sent someone else into battle to get them killed. He just did all the bad things you could possibly do. Here's what David says. He doesn't say in Psalm 51, restore to me my salvation. He knows he already has it. He says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He understands that he can't lose his salvation, but he can lose his joy. And I think some of you have lost your joy. I think you lost your peace. 
I think you've lost it because there's a secret sin that's got you in its grip and instead of dragging it into the light, you've kept it in the closet and I'm just begging you to drag it out. Here's how it continues. It goes on this way. Um, It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so here's um, the danger of me reading this verse to you. The danger is that you would go, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So if I want my prayers to work, I've got to be a righteous person. And to be a righteous person, you have to do good things and not bad things. And so if I do a lot of good things, like if I read my Bible a lot, and if I pray a lot, like we were talking about earlier, and if I worship a lot, and if I delete all the bad songs off my Spotify and put all the good songs on my Spotify, then things will be better. Words are hard. Okay, deal with it. But here's where you might go. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So you think in order for your prayers to be effective, you have to be better. And that is the religious way of looking at things. This is the classic religious error. The error of religion says, if I'm good enough, God will listen to me. But here's what this means. I absolutely believe that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And here's, here's the great news of the gospel, the best news ever. I believe your prayers are powerful and effective, not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ that's yours through the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel. That because of what Jesus has accomplished, your prayers are powerful and effective. That you are righteous, not because of your own goodness, but the whole point, the whole story of the gospel is that you're righteous based on what Jesus has already done for you. So Jesus makes you right, and Jesus makes you whole, and Jesus forgives your sins, and Jesus makes you right before the Father. So that ultimately, your prayers are powerful and effective because God sees you the same way he sees his son, Jesus. Like, hear me, your prayers are powerful and effective because God sees you like he sees Jesus that your prayers are most as powerful and effective as Jesus's prayers, not because you're awesome, but because he is, but because God has clothed you in Jesus's righteousness. So if you're a Christian, even if you struggle with sin, even if you struggle with addiction, even if you struggle with failure, God sees your prayers and he hears them and they're powerful and they're effective and they mean something because of what Jesus has accomplished on your behalf. Second to last verse here says this in verse 17. It says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. So um, last year at camp, we studied Elijah. We talked about this guy and it's possible if you read the story of Elijah to kind of think like he's like Superman in the Old Testament. Um, He's doing all these cool things. Miracles are happening. It's this crazy life he lives. And it's really possible to kind of look at all of the people in the Bible and go, well, they made the Bible. So they must be kind of be superhumans. Like there's the people in the Bible and then there's people like me and that's kind of it. And so I'm just kind of always here. But here's what this, what James wants to remind us in this verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Elijah was just like you. Average, ordinary. Sometimes he struggled. Sometimes he was overwhelmed. Sometimes he wasn't very faithful. Sometimes he doubted God's promises. Sometimes he was just like you. But, but here's what I need to understand about Elijah and any person in this world is that God only does great things through average, ordinary people who pray. That if you want God to do great things through your life, if you want God to do great things in your future, I need you to understand um, that God only does great things through average, ordinary people because that's the only type of people they are. If you've ever felt too average, too ordinary, too unspecial for God to work through you, I need you to know that's the only type of person God works. That's exclusively what he does. He takes ordinary people, average people, unnoticed people, and he uses them in great ways. Maybe you feel unnoticed in this room. Maybe you feel like you're not like the person everyone knows here. I need you to know that God wants to do great things through your life, not because you're awesome, not because you're super special and unique. He just wants to take you in your average, ordinary life and lift you up because you have the faith to trust him in prayer. This is how he's about to end. And then here's the final words. I want you to see the final words of the book of James, the final words of Jesus' brother. Here's what he says. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, this is interesting. He's talking about worship, he's talking about prayer, he's talking about all these different things, and then suddenly he ends with this. He says, if someone's kind of wandering away, if someone's kind of aimlessly walking away from Jesus and you turn them back, he says, this is gonna do two things. It's gonna cover the error of their way. It's gonna cover a multitude of sins and it's gonna save them from death. So it's really fascinating. Like this whole book has been talking about all these different things. Now we're talking about prayer and we're talking about worship and then it ends with this. But here's what I would remind you of, that since the very beginning of the book of James, we have tried to say that faith, what? 
works, right? That faith, if it's going to mean anything, if it's going to mean anything in this world, it has to work. And so here's kind of the final thought I want to give you on the book of James, that your faith only works if it makes a difference in this world. Your faith only works if it makes a difference in this world. Your faith only matters if it makes a difference in this world. Like it is not just about you intellectually affirming the things about Jesus. It's not just about you knowing worship songs in this place. It's not just about you coming to church. Like if your life makes no difference on the people around you, the people who are wandering away from Jesus or the people who have never met Jesus or the people who are unsure about God's promises to them, if your faith makes no difference in the life of anyone else, your faith might not be working. But I'm telling you, if your faith is the type of faith that makes a difference in people's lives, the difference in the lives of the people sitting next to you, the people in this room, the people at your school and the people in your family, that's the type of faith that James is calling us toward. He ends his book with this claim uh, about how we're called to bring people back who are wandering away and how that covers over a multitude of sins. It actually saves them, actually does something meaningful in their life to remind us that from the very beginning, his point has been, your faith is not just about you believing a bunch of things. It's about that belief, that strong belief in who God is leading you to be the type of person who does something in this world. And that's the same type of faith we've always been inviting you to do. A faith that lives and loves like Jesus. A faith where you encounter people and it changes you and it changes how you act with people. It changes the way you walk out of the room tonight. It changes the way you interact with your family when you go home tonight. That's the kind of faith that you're called to through the book of James. So here's what we're going to do. Our band's going to make their way up right now. And we're going to close in singing. And, and remember, we talked about our faith, our worship is, is more than singing, but it's not less than that. And so we do want to be a people who sing. But, but here's what I want to actually do as our band gets all ready right now. I just want to invite everyone in the room to bow your heads and close your eyes. Um, what we're going to do right now, I talked about prayer. And I said, the only way to get better at praying is to pray. And, and so right now, I, I'm just going to, as our band even gets ready right now, um, I'm just going to give us a little space of silence right now just to pray. I'm going to ask our band not to start playing. I just want to give you a moment to pray. And maybe your prayer would be this simple tonight. God, I stink at praying. Make me a better prayer. Make me someone who is better at prayer. God, help my prayer life grow. God, I pray that this spring, this year, 2019, would be the year that I become a praying man, that I become a praying woman. I want to give you that space right now to pray to God. And maybe your prayer would be as simple as you asking God to make you the type of person who can pray. I'm going to give you that silence right now. So Father, thank you for the book of James. Thanks that you put it in our Bible. Father, thank you that we get to learn from it and grow from it. So I pray for someone in this room right now who's struggling with prayer. They feel insecure about it. They feel overwhelmed by it. God, I pray you would make them a woman of prayer. Make them a man of prayer. Make them the type of person that gets alone with you and cries out to you like James commands us to do. I pray that we would be a place of prayer, that this would be a house of prayer. I pray that this would be a house of worship, that our singing would please you, God, that our singing would fill our hearts with joy, that we would commune with your son Jesus through the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray most of all that our faith would work, that it would be the type of faith that makes a difference in this world. God, help us be those types of people. Father, I praise you once more for your book, for your Bible, for your word. May it shape our lives, may it shape our prayers, may it shape our singing in every way. God, we love you. Help us follow Jesus with reckless abandon. We pray this in Christ's name. And all God's people said real loud, amen.